Well, we certainly do greet everyone who's with us here tonight. Isn't it good to be together Amen. in the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace? <laughs> God bless everyone. <laughs> and I wanted to make a couple of extemporary comments before I begin. Our prayer meetings, well, let me use another word. I don't like that. I've got bad memories about that term. Praying together. As I understand it, this is what the church at Antioch was doing when in Acts 13 it says they were ministering unto the Lord. I understand that to mean they were, they were praying. No doubt in the Holy Spirit. But when you think of that, that our, it's a min, time we're ministering unto the Lord. It's like an aroma rising up in our prayers that if we pray properly our prayers will blend together yeah, you want to pray as a member of the body and as one who's ministering to the Lord and one other thing that we pray by ordinary standards a long time but there's been a lot longer prayer meetings than what we just had you know yeah. But those that you're not accustomed to praying out loud or perhaps you're young and not learning to pray, if you will listen to these prayers, you'll learn how to pray. How to pray publicly, I'm talking about. See, the world needs a lot more public prayers. So that's a, that's a good ministry. You can, uh, you can learn. I, I learn. Derek, as you tune in and uh, don't, don't withdraw into a little bubble, a little mental bubble, and think only you're just listen to what's being said and be very instructive. Now tonight we're again in Jude. This will be our 14th exposition as we're drawing to a, into the last part of it. And it was written for times such as times we're living in and for situations we face. Paul, you know, said part of his afflictions, he mentioned them in 2 Corinthians 11. They were very extraordinary. His revelations are very extraordinary, and his afflictions are very extraordinary. So if you want extraordinary knowledge of God, extraordinary fellowship with God, well, yeah. you figure it out. That's, right. That's the price tag that comes along with it. Yeah, but he listed in his afflictions, which he endured, the care of all the churches. That was the last thing he mentioned. Uh -huh. Mentioned beatings and prisons and perils. And the last thing he said was, and uh -huh. that which comes on me daily, the care, concern for, desire for, interest in all the churches. Now, it's not that the apostle didn't have concern for anybody else, but it, he didn't really say a lot about anybody else. Interesting, isn't it? So he said, I have a burden for Spain. I have a burden. We don't question that. But like I don't like burn within when I hear that. I say, well, that's, that's nice. I mean, we're not against that at all. Paul, there was the only thing, closest thing that came to that when he was in Athens, he took a little tour of the city while he was yes. waiting after he'd spent time preaching in the synagogues. He took a little tour of the city. said he was stared inside. Yeah. Uh -huh. He stared inside. Well, let, me, let me put it in today's language. He was stared inside when he saw all the movie theaters and the gyms. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. He saw interest in everything but God. That's right, yeah. The true God. And misplaced religious devotion. He was That's the closest thing you get to really concern for people outside. 
the faith. It doesn't mean they didn't have it. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that's not what they talked about. To my knowledge, Paul never expressed a concern for other heathen cities or continents. Rome was filled with all manner of immorality and vice and sin. It was a, a leader in decadent decadence. But he never prayed for Rome. He just desired to go to Rome. When he went, when he went to Rome, he wanted to meet with. He wanted to go to God's people in Rome. Uh -huh. yeah. It's interesting. And when Paul first traveled with Barnabas, you remember, he said, "Let's go again." He first they went out. Uh -huh. They were apostles of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit called them to a special ministry. Separate Paul and Barnabas and Saul for the work I've called them to. Uh -huh. They went out and they preached all over. And he called Barnabas, let's, uh, let's go again and visit our brethren. Let's visit our brethren in every city where they, we have preached the word and, and see how they do. Yeah. Amen. I never heard anybody go into a city and visiting all the churches to see how they do. I never heard of such a thing. Oh, I never have heard of such a thing. Maybe it's happened, but I never heard of it. All the professional religious men, I've never heard of any of them doing that. Checking out how the brethren are doing. Yeah. How wonder how the churches are doing. Yeah. Let's don't ask someone, let's go visit them. Mm -hmm. uh, if he were living today, this would be a rather depressing assignment. Yeah. You can imagine what he'd think if he stepped into some of the <laughs> frolicking fun-loving services, he, he would be very disappointed. The point of significance in the book of Acts when things are really picking up and the number of disciples are being multiplied was that throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, the churches were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, and were multiplied. Yes, that was a significant, <laughs> interesting, isn't it? How it's stated. A significant effort was put forth in Acts 15:41 to confirm the churches. Yeah. That's not confirm like a Catholic or a Lutheran confirms. That's not what that means. Right. That means stabilize. Yeah. That would really be a challenging full-time job stabilizing the churches. Just if you did it just like in this part of the city. Uh -huh. yeah. Can you imagine? Do you know anyone personally? Do you know anyone who wants to stabilize the churches? I'm, I, I, I do. I know some. You probably know some, but you have to like do some thinking, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. To come up, come up with a name. This priority is also seen in the apostolic writings. All the writings were the churches. All the writings were the Christians. Mm -hmm. The only exception would be Theophilus, who was some kind of government official, but he believed. Yeah. And Luke wrote to him to mm -hmm. assure him of the truth of the things that he believed. Mm -hmm. I say these things because this is uh, this is what Jude is doing. Mm -hmm. He saw a deficiency in this, wherever these people were. He doesn't really identify a particular group, but they were in a backward stance. They were going backward. Mm -hmm. They had become so obtuse that some men who weren't even in Christ, they were false teachers, had come in undetected and pretty much taken over the teaching. And he was very concerned about this and he wanted he he wanted to talk about other things but he couldn't tell them about the good stuff. Not at first. Yeah, that's right. See because when you aren't walking in the spirit, we, you you have no right to hear the good stuff. 
We're not going to set the nourishment on the table of someone who delights in eating garbage. That's right, yes. And you will find neither Jesus did this nor any of the apostles. They would address that situation of a bad appetite, uh -huh. stunted appetite, people not taking advantage of the plentitude that's in Christ, mm -hmm. content with shallow, meaningless jargon. Mm -hmm. They'd address this, and that's what, that's what Jude is doing. Amen. He knows that an unholy church is not going to do anything for God. Yeah. And they may get up and prance and dance and shout. God's not going to use an unholy people. He, in fact, he won't even recognize an unholy people. He said, now, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Come out from among them now. This is Holy Spirit language, 2 Corinthians 6. Come out from among them. Come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Amen. This is God talking to the church. Amen. You mean he didn't receive them? No. Well, he originally did, but they backed out of the house. Yeah. Uh -huh. They chose to live someplace else. So you got to do this before I'll receive you. Then he gives them, gives them some promises. He's, first of all, he says, you can't mix. You can't mix the holy and the profane. You can't mix believers and unbelievers. You can't mix Satan and Christ. It's, you can't do this. So if you do come out from among them, I'll, I'll receive you. Amen. You'll be sons, my sons and daughters. Amen. Then he says, now, having these promises, dearly beloved, Cleanse yourself, let's cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Yes. That's the objective Jude has to get people to do that. And we're going to be in the uh, 20th verse. But ye, beloved, beloved, but ye, beloved, but ye, beloved, yeah. building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. But, <coughs> well, you don't want to read over words like that. Some versions say, and and yet. Uh, that's pretty weak. A little English lesson here. Grammatically speaking, the word translated but is a primary particle, adversative, expressive antithesis or opposition or continuative expressing continuity and continuation. So, so, what, so what in the world does that mean? It means while all this bad stuff is going on, simultaneous with that, there's some stuff that's required in God's people. Yeah. Uh -huh. They're expected to continue on with all this hodgepodge going on. Right. They're expected to continue on, so it's a, it's a contrast. It's a word of contrast. Uh -huh. But, I've told you about these false teachers. Uh -huh. I told you about what's going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell you to pray for them. That's right. Yeah. Am I, or am I, am I right? Yes, amen. He didn't say, oh, don't forget to pray for them. He didn't say to pray for them. But, Bye. all right, I'm going to turn to you folk now. Mm -hmm. You can't just decide to get away from that. You've got to get into that. Yeah, amen. That's right. amen. In a nutshell, this small word is saying that while these false teachers were conducting themselves in full accord with their depraved nature, the people of God, by marked contrast, were to be found absolutely faithful to the Lord. Amen. Growing up into Christ and living in a state of total yieldedness, to the Lord. That was to happen. It's possible, knowing this religious circumstances we're in, to sit and gripe about them all the time. Yeah, it's possible, it's possible to do that. Some people do it. They just sit and gripe about it all the time. They put up, then this is wrong and that is wrong. Well, we don't say it's wrong to do that, but you got to get beyond that. 
You've got to say, then that being the case, I'm going to pick up my speed. I'm going to throw myself more into this thing than I ever have before because I see that I must do that to survive this other assault here. Because if you don't strengthen yourself, Satan will roll over you. And he's able to do it, you thinking that you've advanced. If you do a fast two sous shuffle in the name of the Lord, really think you've done something. Hmm? No, don't think that people will think this. But spiritual growth is always maintained in an environment of hostility and opposition. It's designedly so. You say, why does, why does God do that? Because that's the way he sifts out the people that aren't real. That's how he does it. He doesn't say, now here's the guidelines. Whoever doesn't measure up, kick him out. And whoever does measure up, bring him in. That's how he does it. He does it by telling you what you've got to do, whatever environment you're in. You've got to fight the good fight of faith. You've got to do it. Don't make a difference where you are. You have to do it. You have to resist the devil wherever you are. You have to lay hold on eternal life wherever you are. If a lot of things are against you, you got to do it anyway. If you don't do it, you're not one of the chosen few. That's right, yeah. If you do do it, take heart. Yeah. You're one of the number. Amen. <laughs> yes. Remember Jesus said, I pray not that you take them out of the world, but keep them yes. from keep the them. evil. Keep them from the evil. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, your thinking can be what I call evil affected by off spiritual off-centeredness. All error isn't like blatant contradiction of truth. Some is just tilted a little bit. It's off center. If you follow it to its logical conclusion, you don't you end up way off from God someplace. So we can't overstate the fact that when there are times like this, and we're in times like this, the people of God have to accelerate their spiritual effort. Say, how do I do that? That's that you you've got to work that. We I can't tell you how to do it. You've got to work that out. Amen. Whatever makes you dull and makes it easy for you to forget God and neglect the Word of God, neglect a symbol of the saints of God, neglect love of the brother, whatever causes that, you've got to get away from it. Amen. And you're the one that has to do it. We can't pass a law to teach you how to do it. Because if you don't, truth will, as Isaiah said, truth will fail and fall in the street. Truth, as powerful as truth is, it cannot survive an environment of indifference. Yeah, that's right. It'll fail. This is Isaiah 59, 14, and 15. It'll fail and fall in the street because of religious. Indifference. So the effects of indifference and dullness can't be overstated. <laughs> they disarm the soul. So we talked about not being mediocre. That's the thing, if I let myself, I could dwell an inordinate amount of time on that subject because I so much hate mediocrity. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Amen. Yeah. Solomon said. The mind must be girded up. In those days, the, uh, they wore long robes for warmth as well as modesty. But when they worked, they had to hike them up and tuck them under the, what we'd call a belt. So they gave them more from, some more f movement. Free, you could move more freely. So you, your mind has loins. You've got to get the mental drapery off your mind. You gotta tuck it in. Get all the distracting elements tucked in and out of the way and gird up your mind so you can think. Amen. Yeah. See some people they can't think. 
you talk to them, you always have to use short sentences, you know, and small words and baby words. You got to talk. Why? Because they can't think. Mm -hmm. That's what the trouble is. They can't think. They are like they are like educated idiots. They don't know how to use their mind. But in Christ, you've got to learn to use your mind. Amen. Sometimes that's just about all you got. Sometimes you get in a situation where your mind is just about the only accessible resource you've got to work with. Gird up the loins of your mind. Amen. Be sober. That's what Jude's writing about. Amen. Given? Yes. Girding up of the mind. That's a, that's a, a, a preparation, a, a, part, a, a participation by the one who wants to do the thinking and a preparation for the Lord's blessing right. to give the thinking. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Good. Now remember, these people Judas right into had not been thinking. Because we know they hadn't because these teachers had crept in unawares. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> they were leading them down a path that ultimately led to damnation and the people didn't even know it. Why didn't they know it? Minds hadn't been girded up. Yeah. Same thing happened when Paul went to Jerusalem. He says that when he was there, false brethren were unawares, unaware, same words in, our t in Jude, were unawares brought in who came in privately or privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus. <laughs> this was Jerusalem. Yeah. Yeah. Not Athens, Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. There were people there that were dragging their feet spiritually. And they brought in, undetected, mm -hmm. some people who wanted to spy out their liberty, wanted to take away the freedom that's in Christ Jesus, yeah. freedom to draw near, uh -huh. freedom to be holy. Huh? Freedom to be godly. They wanted to take that away. They came in unawares. Well, in the process of the meeting, it was it was made known. One of the ways was, Paul said, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. We didn't let them monopolize the conversation for not even for an hour. We were there for a long time. We didn't. We didn't listen to them. You want to know how you get rid of people that teach the wrong thing? Don't listen to them. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, they'll leave pretty soon. They'll leave. Don't listen to them. If you want to keep someone that is speaking the truth, listen to them. Usually defection must be matched by unusual advance in the saints. That's in this but mm -hmm. word. Thus Jude reminds the saints to conduct themselves in contradiction to what's wrong. Now this can only be done deliberately. This cannot be done accidentally. <clears throat> you live deliberately in such a manner that, that it will openly challenge these false views. Yeah, yeah. You'll provide something that will contrast. They'll see in you something, con they, whether they accept it or not, that's something else, but it will, yeah. they've got to see the contrast before anything is actually done. That's why Paul said that he wanted the people to abound more and more in all knowledge and judgment. Mm -hmm. Abound, as in, that's increased by, we would say, by leaps and bounds, we would say. Not just a little, little minuscule increase, you know. That, that's not what, the Bible wouldn't call that increase. Yeah. Uh -huh. Increase by scriptural definition isn't that, that it isn't this. It's this. Yeah. Increase, abounding, more and more in all knowledge and judgment. Again, he said to the Philippians in Philippians 1.9, that their love must abound more and more. Your love must abound more and more in knowledge and judgment. You must it 
you must increase in your ability to discern what's right and what's wrong. Judgment. It's increase in your familiarity with the things of God so you can handle the things of God. So when you hear Bible words and they don't confuse you, abound. This is while all this other stuff is going on. That's the point that, that Jude is making. If in fact, when there's erroneous teaching abounding and the electronic media has accelerated this situation, If, if in that situation the people of God are not abounding, a major falling away is inevitable. Yeah, that's right. It will happen, that's what that is, what has happened. Uh -huh. yeah. It's actually the church's fault that it happened. Yes. Yeah. It was implemented by the devil working, mm -hmm. but when the church dropped off its armor, and begin to sit down on its lees yeah. and quit running the race, it opened the door for the devil and it's actually their fault that this happened. Yeah. Who was it that God blamed when Israel's defection? He blamed their prophets. Yeah. That the prophets had led them astray. Their religion was the weak thing. Uh -huh. Now few people recognize this, but when you have a consistently weak spiritual presence of a group or a person. The reason is is because their theology is flawed. Yeah. Theology is knowledge of God. Their knowledge of God is uh -huh. flawed. Uh, warned of this in Psalms yeah. 1, where he said, Blessed is the man that walketh not yeah. in the counsel of his yeah. ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, uh -huh. nor sitteth in the, seat, in the seat of the scornful. Yet, what you're talking about is they kind of didn't, uh, they went for, for with this blessing that God says he's going to bless people that turn away from these um Thing, these things that draw you away, okay. they just are sitting with the seed of the scornful, with the old way of the ungodly, and here's the result. Yes, amen. Mm -hmm. Brother Gibbon? Yes. Yes, um, I like how you said, like, we shouldn't even listen to him. It, God said, this is my beloved son, hear him. Hear him. Yeah. Right. So, like, if you listen to someone that isn't preaching in accordance with with that, then you're not listening, then you're, you're giving ear to something that's other than Jesus. Amen. Uh -huh. Amen. Amen. Yep. At what you just said, a lot of people do not think that's very important. Uh -huh. yeah. They don't, they don't think it's important. What it is. About that point, that whenever we give ear to those types of things, we're also subjecting our mind to this. Yes, yeah. yeah, that's right. And so it's a disarming, it has a disarming yes. effect on yes. our mind. Uh -huh. yes. mm -hmm. See the the apostles and those godly people of old. They knew that the gospel has power. They knew that no word of God is void of power, the scriptures say. They knew that. And so they didn't have to compromise because they, the, they knew where the power was, see. Mm -hmm. For instance, in Ephesus, the distinction between people who have the power and people who don't have the power was revealed in these seven sons of Sceva. Uh -huh. They were Jews. They went to school, I guess, about how to cast out demons. Yeah. Knew how to do it. So they found this demon-possessed man. They attempted to exorcise the demon, exorcise the demon. So they said, we command you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Yeah. I said, that ought, that, ought, that ought to do it. Uh -huh. That ought to do it because the Jesus Paul preached, they'd come out, they'd come out under that name. Uh -huh. We rebuke you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. There's seven of them now, there's seven of them. So that one man jumped on them, beat them up, and they fled wounded and naked. And word of it got around. I say, word of it got around. Yes. A person can't discount 
the power of words. Mm. That this is a this is an attack on a person's yes, faith. Yes, amen. What Sister Barb said there, what uh, I had some thoughts along that same line. Just because a person uses language of scripture doesn't mean that they're speaking the message of scripture. Mm -hmm. They can rest it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it can come at you from a lot of different uh, camps. Uh, I'm thinking about some of these PBS specials where they have clergymen uh, get on there and, and uh, supposed to be talking about who Jesus was or who Paul is. It is so offensive. If a person can sit and listen to that stuff being dumped in their ear, there's something seriously wrong with how serious you are about what Scripture says. Amen. It doesn't take long at all to be totally obnoxious by their unbelief and by their by them refuting the express doctrine of Scripture concerning Christ. And see, there's this is a, a heads up to anybody. It, I don't care who it is. Also, there would be, you know, an angel of life even yeah. that come with any other gospel to reject them out of hand. Mm -hmm. and that's not the same as sticking your head in the sand. That's the mm -hmm. that's like not. It's like the shield of faith. You're holding that up. These words are like a sandblaster. It yeah. makes it thinner and thinner and thinner mm -hmm. to where eventually things can poke through. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Uh -huh. Now this the situation in Ephesus, you had these seven sons of Sceva. Paul was there too. Sons of Sceva, their word was totally powerless. But the word of Paul wasn't totally powerless. It said of the result of his preaching, many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Why, why did the word of God grow mighty and prevail? Because it had power. Yeah. And the second-hand testimony of the sons of Sceva didn't have power. That's right. Why are churches unable to turn the tide? No power. That's right. I understand there are circumstances where mm -hmm. God doesn't want the tide turned. I mean, I, yeah. I don't know what, only God knows who those situations yeah. are, but there are some that cannot believe. Acts 13 says even Jesus went there. Jesus went there. They couldn't believe. That's right. Yeah. So he left. Uh -huh. He left. Wherever you are with someone, if you do finally come to the conclusion they can't believe, get out. Amen. Leave. Jesus did. Yes. You got. You got to know what you're, yeah. you have to know what you're doing. You understand. Uh -huh. So this is the uh, intention of Jude's admonition, is for this consistent testimony of truth to be found in the brethren. That's right. Anything that's going to be done in society that honors God is going to be done mm -hmm. through people who are consistent Amen. Yeah. and who keep the word of God yes. Amen. and who don't stop running and yes. don't stop believing yeah. and don't stop resisting the devil. They can yeah. continue in this Amen. day after right. day after day and that's, that's what makes the difference. That's right. And he tells us how to make those kinds of judgments. We don't guess about it. He says if you if they receive your words, yeah. well, then your blessing is. If Amen. they don't, well, then knock the dust off your feet and get out of there. Amen. Yeah. Now, Jude says, but we got the the but. Yeah. By by way of contrast with these teachers, yes. the answer isn't for you to do nothing. Uh -huh. But ye beloved, mm. ye beloved. I've dealt some of this before, but some versions read, Dear Friends. I mean, I don't like really the sound of that, but that's the NIV. And a lot of other versions. Most later versions do say, Dear Friends. My loved ones, dearly beloved, dearly loved friends. Now, the translation friends is wholly inappropriate. I don't care what version of the Bible has it. 
it's a wholly inappropriate. There is a word in the Bible, Hebrew and Greek, for friends, and it's not the same as beloved. It means a, a neighbor who's close by proximity. Sometimes it's a friend, not a friend over there in Timbuktu. It's an associate or someone in proximity to the person. When Abraham is called the friend of God, it's because he was close. God has never called Abraham his friend. We ought to draw attention to that. Abraham was called God's friend because he was close. Mm -hmm. So the word friend, I'm, I highlight the word, yeah. the word friend. A brotherly love, this is, this is different. Mm -hmm. This is not friend. Beloved is not beloved. That's not friend. Mm -hmm. By nature, men have the capacity to make friends. Mm -hmm. Saved or lost. Yeah. Uh -huh. They have that capacity to make friends. Judah had a friend that was an Adolmite. He was a heathen. He had a friend. Judah, friend, friend. The Jews made Blastus, aren't you glad that's not your name? Made Blastus, who was the king's chamberlain, their friend so they could get through to Herod. See? But brotherly love, that's not the manner of beloved or brotherly love. Not the manner of it. Then the body of Christ, brotherly love involves preferring one another. Also, oh, so it's just not an associate. I I, def, I defer to their interests. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> That's brotherly love. The love of the brethren is necessarily preceded by having purified your souls and obeying the truth through the spirit of the unfeigned love of the brethren. See, you purify your souls. In obeying the truth through the Spirit, mm -hmm. unto or in order to unfeigned or unpretentious love of the brethren. Mm -hmm. See, you can't love the brethren if you didn't get that purification. Uh -huh. It's just pretension. It's just pretending. That's all. It's not real. Right. Yeah, first of all, you have to be purified mm -hmm. through the Spirit. Yeah. Purified, and it's in order that you can love the brethren. Uh -huh. Unfeigned, unpretentious. See, some people have a special church face. That's right. Yep. They do, they do. They have a special uh -huh. church face. Mm -hmm. They're pretending. Yes, Justin. I think I says, uh, it, it makes sense because if you really think about it, how could you, unless you prefer their life over your own, you can't, it says, okay, it says, greater love hath no man than this, and he lay down his life for his friends. Yeah. So, in that purity, it, it makes it to where that's possible. Amen. Uh -huh. You got it. Uh -huh. That's right. See how, see how different this is in the, uh -huh. it's more than like respect. Yeah, right. Yeah. There's respect in it, but it's uh -huh. just, it's just part. It's not uh -huh. the, not the whole. Unfeigned love of the brethren. But the love is evidence mm -hmm. that you've passed from death unto life. Mm -hmm. It's your proof. It's your proof. That's right. Hereby we know we passed from death unto life because uh -huh. we love the brethren. That's right. Amen. These brethren aren't lovable just to everybody. Well, it isn't that they're obnoxious socially or like that. They're, they're the best citizens there are. They're the most productive workers there are. But they, uh, they're not attractive to the world. Yes? Yeah, this has got to be something that, um, if this is going to be an evidence to us, this has got to be something that we're not going to be able to go, do I really love the brother? Yeah, or do I not? <laughs> Does, is this real? Yeah. Or is this not real? It's got to be something we can be sure of. Yes. If it's an evidence. Uh -huh. Amen. Yeah, amen. Amen. Yeah, let's say that the Lord's Day comes around. Hmm.
and you've heard the words forsake not the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some is uh -huh. some people do this but exhort one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. What day is it? Well, it's the Lord's day. What other day do you see approaching, pray That's tell? Right, yeah. Huh? Amen. Somebody, That's the second coming. You see the second coming approaching? Yeah, no. You don't know the day or the hour. That's right. No, you don't see it approaching. It's the first day of the week. Yeah. Amen. Paul James and John said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Yes. And he was on an island. Apparently, if he wasn't all by himself, he's almost. So the Lord's Day comes around. This is the Lord's Day. This is when we break bread. It so happens that the World Series is on that day, too. Yeah, well, you know, I'm quite a baseball fan. But I love the brethren more than the games. So I'll, I'll defer to... That's how you know whether you love the brethren or not. Which do you prefer? Which do you prefer? Some people, they unfortunately are in a marriage where one's in and one's out. And that's not the way they wanted it, but evidently that marriage started out with both out. And one came in, one didn't. Mm -hmm. What do we do? Well, Paul says, first of all, you've got to live peaceably. Uh -huh. If you can't live peaceably, believer, exit. Yeah, that's right. What he said, First uh -huh. Corinthians says, what he said. Yeah, you're not under bondage. Uh -huh. God's called us to peace, not to war. So, right. peaceably means the unbeliever doesn't interfere uh -huh. with my life toward God. Amen. It doesn't mean, all right, we'll draw peaceably. I'll just quit reading the Bible. I'll quit talking about the Lord. I'll quit going to the fellowship. That's not what he's talking about. Yeah. He's talking about in what God requires of you. Uh -huh. You don't. You refuse to give that up. And if that causes peace that can't be resolved, you're not under bondage. That's yeah. what he taught, First Corinthians 7. See, these are ways you find out whether you love the brethren or not. It's who you defer to. Yeah. Whose interest do you have? Because if you have an interest in them, they'll have an interest in you. Mm -hmm. well, which of us hasn't experienced this? Right. Yeah. You've experienced the brethren rallying to your cause, yes. which you were doing things that would have been very difficult mm. to do, but they, the brethren that proved they, they loved one another, see? Yes. Mm. Brother they loved, then is the evidence of passing death and life. But that's not all. God teaches us mm. to love one another. <clears throat> now, this presumes that you're teachable and close enough to the Lord to be taught. Really yes. That the love will only exist when there's a likeness, because as you pointed out earlier, Christ and Satan cannot mix. It's yes. not uh -huh. neither side can make themselves love the other unless there's some kind of union made. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, amen. Now establishing that loving the brethren doesn't spring from human nature itself. Paul wrote to those who possess this love in Thessalonica. He said, um, as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of or by God to love one another. So I don't have to have a long dissertation about this. As we mentioned frequently, Brother Gene reminds us of this, Paul was in Thessalonica three weeks, three Sabbaths. We're not sure it was even any more than three days, but three Sabbaths. That's all these people were exposed to. That's right, yeah. Huh? Uh -huh. Three Sabbaths, that's all these people were exposed to. And God taught them how to love one another. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so this isn't like for long-term yeah. yeah. disciples. Uh -huh. Now, I'll, I'll be the first to tell you that, first of all, a person has to be in Christ to be taught to love, but there are some people that they can't be taught this way. Some people in Christ, they can't be taught this way, so there has to be an elaborate apostolic instruction mm -hmm. on the subject. Yeah. If any man love not his brother, you know, so forth. That's why that elaborate instruction is given, because they weren't close enough to God to get this. There's a lot of stuff you can get firsthand, and then when you read it in Scripture, it confirms what you yeah, already knew. Right. Yeah. 
That, brethren, is a most pleasant experience. You never heard it before. You've, you've got this personal persuasion. It won't be at a fine detail level. I understand, I understand that. But it'll be something you kind of sensed as true. You didn't know anything was in the Bible about it. And then all of a sudden, well, you read, you read. See, the law was written on your heart. Amen. Put it in your mind. That's what that was. Uh -huh. And the love of the brethren can be like that. God can teach you. So he doesn't have to say like he did to the Corinthians. They didn't love one another. He said, look, you're the weaker brother. Look what you're doing to the weaker brother. Wow. See, you're suing one another at the law. What, what's going on down there? Yeah. Uh -huh. There's divisions among you. Uh -huh. They didn't love one another. Uh -huh. That's what was going on. Yeah. They could if they had just listened to God, but they didn't. So Paul had to, uh -huh. Paul had to comment upon it. Spent 18 months there. Yeah, 18 months at Corinth, that's right. Yeah. You have to have ears to hear, of course. You understand that if, yeah. if the Lord teaches you to love one another. This is best assessed after it's happened. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll feel yourself drawn to a certain person. You hardly know anything at all about that person except that they love Christ and are following in the right path. That's just about all you know about them. But you love that person just as though you'd known them all your life and knew the all's and the ins and outs. Amen. Why? God taught you. God, Amen. God taught you. God knows the best of us could do with a lot of love. Yes. There's times I'm thankful a brother loved me. Sometimes you'll feel rather unlovable yourself. Uh -huh, yeah. You'll feel rather unlovable. Mm -hmm. But the people of God will love you anyway. Yes, amen. If all that appears, if all of this that we've mentioned about being separate and so forth, it seems too difficult. Exactly how could you go about substantiating that God would personally teach a person to love his people who cannot be described as someone who's walking in the light and living by faith and walking in the spirit. How could you explain God teaching a person who wasn't like that? What form of reasoning could you use to convince me, for instance, that a person who was not clearly living for the Lord, that God would teach that person the finer nuances of the kingdom of God. How would you establish that that could be done? I'm going to affirm it couldn't be done. That's one of the benefits of walking in the spirit, living by faith, walking as dear children and pleasing God, and whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That one of the benefits of that is that it opens up God's mouth to you. Amen. Yeah. And yeah. God will teach you and show you things. Whatever you, whatever you think of the brethren, it's, it's Christ's brethren, you understand. It's not, they're your brethren, they're your brethren too, but they're primarily Christ's brethren. Yes, that's right. He calls the little ones, even, who is there who shall offend one of these little ones? My brethren. Yeah. You're Christ's brethren. He's not ashamed to call us brethren. That's right. He that begat us, Christ is God. He that begat us is God. Wherefore, he's not ashamed to call us brethren. That's the brethren we're talking about uh -huh. now. We're not talking about the, the denominational brethren uh -huh. or the Baptist brethren, you know. The Presbyterian brethren, would, uh -huh. like we say, what's that? Yeah, that's right. That even sound good to me. <laughs> what's that? Yeah. Brethren of Jesus, see, something real has had to happen for you to be Christ, brother. That's right. Yeah, amen. You, just, you just don't lip off some kind of a creed and all of a sudden you're one of the brethren. Yeah, that's right. All of that kind of is practiced in a lot of places. Uh -huh. You promise this, you promise that, but you confess this, you confess that. that that's what makes you what, no, what makes you what you are is that God has begotten you. Uh 
and accepted you and you're Christ's brother, you have an obligation and your feet will be held to the fire on this subject. You have got to love those people. No matter where they are, or who they are, or what they look like. Mm -hmm. yes. Maybe some of them are in prison. Yeah. Uh -huh. Maybe some of them are all crippled up. Uh -huh. Maybe some of them can't talk. Mm -hmm. It seems like they can't think too well. But if they're Christ's brethren, mm -hmm. remember loving them means you prefer them. Mm -hmm. You prefer them. Yeah. You'll do them good. Yeah. Yes. Right there, what you're saying hits upon another aspect of that word beloved, which speaks to one's worthiness of love. Yeah, that's that when we call one another beloved, we're saying, you're wor You are worthy of my love. Amen. Because Amen. Christ loved you, yeah. loves you, yeah. and called you brother, called you sister. Therefore, you're worthy of Amen. my mm -hmm. love, too. And we can't say that to the world. No. Uh, right. Amen. See, what? if this was universally acknowledged, sectarianism would crumble. Yes. It'd fall right. to the ground. There couldn't be denominations uh -huh. at all. There is an enormous emphasis in some teaching that we're not worthy. Oh, yes. There's, there's a sense of what says true. Uh -huh. but, he, but the apostle exhorts us to walk worthy. Walk worthy. That's He's right. made us worthy. Amen. Yes. He's made yes. us worthy. So yes. any worthiness we have is not of our own doing. Yeah, we, right. we acknowledge that it's not of our own doing. Yeah. But it's very real, no? Amen. <laughs> These are walk of being white, for they are worthy. Yeah, amen. Yeah, amen. And therefore, Jude says, beloved, he's confessing he's been taught by God to love these brethren. That's why he's writing to them. And he's, he's writing in the same spirit that Paul wrote to the Hebrew believers. Paul, after he had warned them about falling away and all this in Hebrews 6, he said, we are persuaded of better things of you, brethren, than yeah. things that accompany salvation. That's what Jude's saying in his epistle. That's yeah. what he's saying. I'm telling you this because we're persuaded. Yes. I'm persuaded of better things. You, you, if you can see this, uh -huh. and you can come out from this, uh, this dilemma. Amen. Now, I, I do covet uh, the ability to preach and teach with that frame of mind. Yeah. Amen. Instead of just concluding too quickly that there's no hope. To be able, if there's just a, if there's just a smoking flax, yes. Amen. <laughs> we won't give up. Yes. Smoking flax. Amen. There's some of them. It just needs to be, whew, needs to be fanned up into a flame. See, so uh -huh. they they go they they go to church. They don't get any fan work. Nothing to work up the place. Just smoke till it smolders out. Yeah. Yes. Hebrews 6 takes about those who fall away can't be renewed to repentance. Before that, he says, let's move on. And after that, he says, we're persuaded we're of better persuaded. things. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> See, the apostles knew that wherever there's a real uh -huh. new heart, wherever there's been a, a genuine conversion, uh -huh. the Word of God can penetrate yes. into that. That's why they took very seriously a rejection. See, that's why they took very seriously a rejection of the truth. Uh -huh. And I said, well, you brethren, you beloved, instead of being like these false prophets that twist and distort and build up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now Jude now writes words that only the people of God can comprehend. Yeah. This is over the head of everybody else. Uh -huh. You go to someone on the street and say, listen, brother, have you been building yourself up on your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Ghost? And they'll say, huh? What, right, yeah. what are you talking about? Uh -huh. Well, as a matter of fact, you say a lot of church people, they don't know what you're talking about. So this is language mm -hmm. that's tailored for the real people. Yeah. He's speaking in such a manner that the the speaking will divide the people appropriately. 
He doesn't assess the people and say, all you people sit over here, you're unbelievers. All you people sit over there, you're believers. He doesn't do it that way. Yeah. Uh -huh. He speaks a word yeah. that only the believers know what he's talking about, uh -huh. and that word will divide. Yes, amen. Who said of Jesus there was a division among the people because uh -huh. of him. Two times it said yeah. that. Yes. I've asked different ones at different periods of time, um, you know, I'll greet them and you still believe in it? And they're like offended. Yeah. Because I would say such a thing. Well, of course I'm still. You know, it's like. Yeah. I know what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Inspired admonitions uh -huh. are not goals. That's right. Mm -hmm. You've come a long way if you know that. Mm -hmm. When he admonished, that's not a goal. That's that something that determines which side you're on. Yeah, uh -huh. How you respond to that admonition will determine where you are. Yes, yeah. Maybe you're out, maybe you're in, maybe you're on the way out. Maybe you're on the way in, but it'll tell where you're at. It'll make a division among the, among the people. Building up yourselves. Hmm. Other versions say, build yourselves up, build each other, edify yourselves, grow, build up your lives, build yourselves up. What is he saying? That all of you together, build yourselves, all of you together? Or each one is an individual? Well, it's both. Yeah. <laughs> it's both. Yeah. It's a man of the Lord when addressing people. This is co collectively what should be done. We should be building each other up uh -huh. yeah. collectively. Uh -huh. But we won't be able to do it collectively unless we've done it individually. Amen. That's, That's just right. how it works. You've got you to bring something into the assembly. Uh -huh. You have to bring some kind of resource into the assembly uh -huh. that you've got outside the assembly. Yeah. Building up yourselves. Building, that's a edifice. That's where edification it's like building a house. Individuals are to build themselves, they are to build themselves up or perfect themselves or grow up into Christ or mature. Yeah, that's right. yeah, to build themselves. You must be further along tomorrow than you are today. Amen. See? Yeah. Then when we come together, we build ourselves that's right. up. When you're little, you take the same kind of wooden blocks, but you just play with them. Yeah. When you get older, you actually build something it's with right. them. You build. You, you yeah. do something that's functional. Build. Yeah. See, the people of God as individuals and as a, a group in the aggregate are a work in progress. Yes. Amen. We're not finished as individuals, and we're not finished as an assembly. So there's to be progress and growth upward, mm -hmm. whereas the prophet said root downward, yeah. fruit upward. Yeah. Uh -huh. right. Build up your, make yourselves stronger. Be, uh -huh. When you come into the assembly, and when we leave the assembly, we should be stronger than we yes. were when we come in. Amen. See more clearly. Mm -hmm. Yes, brother. Is this like a perversion of this in the church where like building yourselves up is like, it's like, they, it's like tapering off sin. You know, like we're like, well, I, I do ten sins this week, and then next week I'll do eight because I'm a little stronger. Mm. Where it's like, okay. it's got it, you got it, you got to you got to put it away. Yeah, that's you right. Gotta, you got to put it off. You got to put off the old man and put yeah. on the new man. Yeah. Yeah. When we, when we when we come to a building site, we clear off the rubble. We we don't call that building. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, Anyways, I was thinking of um, when Brother uh, Bob was talking about building things as a child and then building things when you're older. I couldn't help but think of Paul when he was talking to the Corinthians. When I was a child, I behaved as a yeah, child, I right. acted as a child. But when I became a man, I put away. Put away. That's right. That's put where away. we grow uh -huh. from feeding on the milk of the word <laughs> to the actual meat of the text yeah. and building on our on our faith. Amen. Mm -hmm. Building. Yeah. Yeah, the, the assembly is a construction site. Yeah, amen. 
It's not a hospital for sinners. Yeah, that's right. Some people say the church is a hospital for sinners. Hospital for sinners. It's a place for saints to grow. Amen. That's right. That's what it is. That's what it's yeah. for. Mm -hmm. Yes. In this building, That's like right. I said, so like if different ones get up and they speak, it's important to be able to listen to all That's and right. be able to kind of get, get things because we've seen how the Lord puts the meetings together oh, yeah. and how there's uh, a theme lots of times to our meetings. So it's wise to be able to discern what the Lord's telling us as a, a body, That's what He's right. doing Amen. in the body, and Amen. what He's trying to perfect Amen. the body, how God is working in us. And He'll work, see. In the individuals, he'll work for them to make a contribution to that end. Mm -hmm. See, it said it'll all work together yeah. for the good. <laughs> yes, Sister Barb. Sometimes you may have a project that comes in a kit that has all these different parts and pieces yeah. that you have to fit together. And there may be a temptation to not recognize the utility of a certain part. Uh -huh. And so you may leave it out. Yes. Yeah. Whatever you're building. But later on, you're going to see the necessity yeah. of where that's placed that's right. in the unit. Yeah. I was thinking about our assembly, kind of like that. We can come to the assembly with a mindset of every everything that is spoken, everything that is added to the meeting. Lord is giving us that resource for a very needed part Amen. of our building yeah. process. Amen. Yep. Amen. And you will, I, I couldn't make a law out of this, but this is my own persuasion, but I think you'll find when you have these independent thoughts that come to you and insights and illumination, the assembly is a place where you can express it. Yeah. Uh -huh. You can actually say it. Yeah. See, some places, some churches, you would sound like an idiot yeah. if you said these insights that you've been given. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When, they, when you're in a valid assembly, when, they, when the whole yeah. is being built up, right. yeah. then what the part saw is expressed yes. and it Amen. enlarges. That subject is enlarged. That's right. See? We've all, uh, yes, brother, go ahead, brother. I, I've heard, I've, I've heard. Honest, honestly, there have been nine year olds in this assembly that have spoken more profound things than <laughs> many professed churches out there. Mm -hmm. I understand. Yeah. I understand mm -hmm. what you're saying. One of the big parts of being in Christ that I think has been underplayed. Yeah is satisfaction mm -hmm. uh, in uh, its satisfaction yeah. uh -huh. that is realized in Christ and yeah. one part of very beneficial satisfaction is what and when what you have thought and what you have said you see is a part of something larger uh -huh. yeah. legitimate a part that's of something right. legitimate that's larger and more beneficial you see well I, ah, I was able to have a thought related to that. Yeah, uh -huh. And it's satisfying to you. Yes, amen. It's just like, in a, in a sense, when we come together, we're, we're preparing a table. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's kind of like a a pot, well, I, don't, I, don't, I hate to call it potluck. It's kind of like a manna munch. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody brings a portion. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah. And it, one, it's syner synergy, it would scientifically be a synergy, and then what you said sharpens up what I see. Right. Together, That's right. our grasp of the kingdom of God is getting, it's getting yeah. bigger. Yeah. That's right. When you first come in, you get a hold of the whole thing like this, you know. Yeah. You really thought you had of God, yeah. Jesus loved me and died for me. That yeah. was about it. That's about what you know. And some people didn't even know that. So all of a sudden you go, whoa, this is this is big. What the Lord has given is exceeding abundantly yeah. treasures and riches and and this is just the ante room. We're not even in the main building yet. Amen. Yes. I, I really like that illustration. It's like, you know, this modern church that only one person gets up to speak, it's like 
being invited to a banquet and there's only biscuits. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and, and there's only one plate and then that's everyone yeah. that gets, yeah. gets the biscuits and that's it. Uh-huh. Yeah. And they're even a little hard. <laughs> yeah, you'll find that that one one dish meals in the body of Christ is, are not too flavorful. It's never it's never a real flavorful, palatable yeah. dish. Uh -huh. You notice that? Oh yeah. Yes. It may be a temptation for some people to look at themselves and think that what they have to offer is not as good as what another one has to offer. And it, you know, it may really be the case that you just need to grow. Mm -hmm. But the best way to grow is to put your hand to the work. Yeah, that's right. Do what you are able to do, mm -hmm. and it's in the process of working that you're able to grow in your ability. Yeah. No, one, no mm -hmm. one who is who is strong in the Lord got to that place without working. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now we, I want to say a word to particularly to young people that are not accustomed, you know, to speaking publicly. That in our in our particular fellowship, you've got opportunity to pray publicly read publicly, mm -hmm. testify publicly, deliver a, th a thought you've had publicly. Take advantage of that. Yeah, amen. Particularly like you're 10 years old and up, uh -huh. take, ad take advantage of that. You, it'll make a different kind of an adult out of you. Yes, it amen. will. Uh -huh. See, there's place for it. You hear, we have, we'll have young children, four or five years old, praying, you know, and, It'll bless your soul, yeah, they've, yeah. because they've they've seen something. That's right. But seeing the body of Christ, no matter how long you've been in the body of Christ, everything God says is precious. Everything, every truth is precious. Uh -huh. It doesn't make any difference if it's a, a child saw it. Uh -huh. When they say it, you see more than they saw. Uh -huh. But you may not have thought about that if they didn't say it. See, uh -huh. so I do encourage uh, young people and young adults. Yes. Make a practice of praying publicly, speaking publicly, reading publicly, uh -huh. singing publicly, if you can do that. Uh -huh. Build yourselves up, but he's very careful. He says, on your most holy faith. Yeah. Faith is like the foundation, the experiential foundation yes. you personally build on. Jesus is the main foundation, see. But faith is the on top of that foundation. Yes. The, on your most holy faith, build on that. This is not faith as a body of doctrine. Some people say that faith is a body of doctrine, yeah. but it's your most holy faith, and the doctrine is not your doctrine. Right, yeah. uh -huh. This is your most holy faith. The faith you have, uh -huh. you can build yourself up on it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You say, well, my faith is rather, I feel like it's kind of small. Build on it. Yes, amen. And when the stuff on it is bigger than the foundation, then That's right, amen. <laughs> God expands yes, that. Amen. God increases your faith. Yes. See, if you don't increase your faith, you just got a tall, skinny tower built uh -huh. on this little bitty. Right, yeah. It'll fall over. Build on your most holy faith, your con your persuasion, what you know is. That's right. See, amen. faith is a substance. Yeah of things over the evidence of things not seen, what you're sure of, uh -huh. what you're confident of, yes. what you know, what you know positive, this is true, build on that. Amen. If this is true, lay a couple of blocks on there. Yes. That means if this is true, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. If this is true, then God will not forsake me. If this is true, I can resist the devil. Yes. And the devil has no rejoinder for no. He doesn't have any kind of a response to no. Build yourself up on your most, most holy faith. Yeah. See, God gave you your faith. Yes. Peter said you obtained it, uh -huh. like precious faith. Right. You, you obtained it, given to you. He gave you to believe. Mm -hmm. It came to you. Faith comes. Yes, amen. Where does it come from? <laughs> it comes from God. Amen. That's where it comes from. What is built on faith must be compatible with faith. See, unlike earthly buildings, which are something like this, but the, the foot's on the foundation has to knit mm -hmm. 
with the foundation. See, it, ha it has to become with the foundation because we have a foundation, we got things built on it, but it's one single building, fitly framed together. Yeah. See, so it's what you build on your faith has got to be something that requires faith in the first place. Yeah, amen. That's right.